It's time to settle this heated debate about Jesus once and for all. Is he God? Is he son of God? Is he part of a trinity? Is he a prophet of God? What do you think? Do you know that the Bible describes God as one and Jesus as a prophet of God in more than 60 verses? If you really care about salvation, this video might open your eyes to the truth. This video might change your life forever. So please watch it until the end first and then judge. You have nothing to lose. Open your Bible with me and make sure that every verse that we read together is exactly how it's written in your copy of the Bible. Before we start, we need to understand what the word Father means first. John 8, 42 Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me. What does the word Father mean here? Is he asking if God is their biological Father? Or does it mean that if you love God and obey God, you will love me? John 8, 43 and 44 Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you will carry out your father's desires. From these verses I understand that the word father means whoever you want to follow. If you choose to follow God, then God is your father, but if you choose to follow the devil, then the devil is your father. John 20, 17 Jesus said, I'm ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. From this verse I understand that God is his father and our father too, not only his father. So the word father means the one that I decide to follow and obey. So if I obey God, then God is my father. Matthew 5, 9 Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. It is stated very clearly here that righteous people are called children of God because they considered God to be their father. Chronicle 28, 5 and 6, talking about the Lord, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit in the throne. He said to me, Solomon, your son is the one who will build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Then God chose Solomon to be his son, and God will be his father. Then son of God is an expression used to refer to a righteous person who obeys the commandments of God the Father. Exodus 4, 22. Israel is my firstborn son. Here the whole nation of Israel is called God's firstborn son. So again, the word God's son is used to describe anyone who is obeying and following God, the father. Genesis 6, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married. Now you tell me what sons of God means, write in the comment section below. Also historically, many rulers have assumed the titles such as the son of God or the son of heaven. It was a nice expression used a lot to describe how close you are to God and how are you obeying him and following him. Now we're ready to read more than 60 verses from the Bible describing Jesus as a man who was assigned the role of a prophet from the one and only God. Gospel of John John 6, 38 For I have come down from heaven not to do by my will but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus is a prophet. He's not speaking based on his own desires. He's fulfilling the will of God who sent him. John 7, 16. Jesus answered, My teachings is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. So Jesus is a prophet sent by God. He's not talking on his own. He's telling us what God teached him. John 8, 25 and 26. Who are you? They asked. Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. Jesus replied, I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy. And what I have heard from him, I tell the world. Jesus is delivering to us what he heard from God. This is what prophets do. John 8, 28 and 29. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Jesus is the Son of Man. God taught him what to say. God sent him to us. Jesus wants to please God. Makes sense? John 8, 40. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Again, Jesus is a man. God told him the truth, and then he is telling it to us. John 4, 19 Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Mm -hmm. Jesus is a prophet. 
John 4, 25 and 26, the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. So what was the job of the Messiah? To explain to the people everything, to explain to the people how to worship God, and he did. John 4, 34, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. God sent Jesus, a man, to finish his work. This is literally the definition of a prophet, like he sent Abraham, Moses, Noah, and many other prophets. John 5:19. Very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. So Jesus can't do miracles by himself. He can do miracles by the will of God, the father, like every other prophet. For example, Moses split the sea by the will of the father, God. Moses is not God, Moses is not son of God, Moses is not part of a trinity, but God gave him the ability to do miracles. John 5.30 By myself I can do nothing, I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Again, Jesus can do anything by himself, because he's just a man, but God can give him the ability to do whatever he wishes. Jesus is not all-knowing like God, he can only judge as he hears. And of course, he is always trying to please God who sent him. John 5.27 And he has given me the authority to judge because he is the son of man. Okay, so Jesus is the son of man. Authority was given to him. If Jesus is God, he will not need someone to give him authority. John 17, 1 and 2 He looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify the Son, so the Son may glorify you for you granted him authority over people. If Jesus is God, who is God praying to? And who is giving God authority? John 17, 3 and 4 The only true God and Jesus Christ. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. It is very clearly written that there is only one true God and there is Jesus. And what is the relationship between them? God sent Jesus. God gave him work to do. John 7, 40. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is a prophet. Unfortunately, most of these men, the early Christians, who agreed on the fact that Jesus is the prophet of God, were prosecuted by the Roman Empire. We will explain that later at the end of the video, so stay tuned. John 9, 17, the man replied, he is a prophet. May God send this man to eternal paradise, him and all who believed in Jesus and followed him for real. John 10, 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. Of course, my father, my God is greater than all. He didn't say I am greater than all. John 12, 49, for I did not speak on my own, but the father who sent me commanded me to say all that. This rule applies to all prophets. They don't speak on their own, God teaches them religion, and then they teach us. John 13, 16 No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Jesus referred to himself as a servant and a messenger. John 14, 15 and 16 If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. He's referring to himself as an advocate that God sent, and telling you that God will send another advocate. What does the word advocate mean? If the word advocate means biological son, does that mean that God will send another one of his biological sons later? How many sons does God have? And if the word advocate means prophet, who is this other prophet that Jesus is referring to that God will send after him? Let me know your answers in the comment section below. John 14, 24 These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. It's clear by now that Jesus is a prophet that God, our Father, sent to deliver a message and teach us our religion. John 14, 28 For the Father is greater than I. I have a question here. If Jesus is God himself, how come the Father is greater than him? Shouldn't they be equal? After all, they are both God, right? Why is one part of God greater than the other? Gospel of Matthew Matthew 4, bar 1 Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Can the devil tempt God? 
Because in James 1.13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. It is very clear that the devil cannot tempt God. Then how is Jesus tempted by the devil? And at the same time, how is Jesus God? Matthew 8.20, Son of Man. Matthew 12.18, Here is my servant whom I have chosen. Matthew 18, 11, for the Son of Man. Matthew 21, 11, this is Jesus, the prophet. Matthew 21, 46, he was a prophet. Matthew 26, 2, Son of Man. Matthew 26, 39, going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. By the way, why aren't Christians right now praying like Jesus did? He fell with his face to the ground and prayed. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And also, if Jesus is God, why is God praying and who is he praying to? Matthew 28:18. All authority has been given to me. Gospel of Luke. Luke 4, 8 Jesus answered, It's written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He didn't say worship me too, just serve him only. Luke 7, 16 A great prophet has appeared among us. Luke 9, 19 One of the prophets. 9, 22 The Son of Man must suffer. God does not suffer. Luke 11, 20 I drive out demons by the finger of God. Prophets get their great ability from God. Luke 18, 19. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Why can't we call him good if he is God? He's clearly saying here, I am not God. This is why you can't call me good. Because only God is good. I am not God. Luke 24, 19. He was a prophet. Gospel of Mark. Mark 6, 4, a prophet is not without honor. Mark 9, 37, the one who sent me. Mark 11, 12, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it has any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season of figs. First of all, God is never hungry. Second of all, God should be all-knowing. How come he didn't know that there was no fruit in the tree? then Jesus is not God. Mark 12, 29, the Lord is one. The Lord is one, not three, and not three in one. Mark 13, 32, but about the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Jesus said he doesn't know when the hour will come, but only God is all-knowing. Mark 15, 34, and this is a nice one. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How come God is crying for God to help him? Does that make sense to you? Let's know in the comment section below. We don't want this video to be hours long, so we will give you only some examples from the rest of the Bible. Isaiah 40, 18 to 25. With whom then you will compare God? To what image will you liken him? To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Nothing is like God. God has no image, God can't be seen, but we could see Jesus. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. Jesus does not fit any of the descriptions listed here about God. Psalm 102.27 But you remain the same, and your years will never end. God will remain the same, will not change to be a baby, then change to be a man, then change to be a buried body, and then get resurrected. God doesn't end. God can't be killed or crucified. Psalm 50.12 The Mighty One, God, says, If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, and all that is in it. But Jesus was hungry after he fasted 40 days, and Jesus needed to pray, eat, drink, and even cry to God for help. Jesus is not God. Deuteronomy 6.4 The Lord is one. 
God is not three in one, God is not two in one, God is one. Numbers 23.19 God is not human, God is neither a man nor son of man. Habakkuk 1.12 My God, the Holy One, you will never die. Again, God does not die, God does not get crucified. Hosea 11.9 For I am God, not a man. 1 Timothy 1.17 Now to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only God. So God is immortal, he can't be crucified. God is invisible, but people could see Jesus. Hebrews 1.12 But you remain the same, and your years will never end. God will never change. Then why did he become a mortal man? If you're in shock now, I'm sure that you've never read the Bible before. Because every page in the Bible screams that God is one, and Jesus is one of the prophets of God. God can't be born, God never dies, God can't be seen, God can't be tortured, God can't be crucified. Jesus never said I am God, Jesus never asked people to worship him, Jesus did not teach Trinity. Abraham, Moses and all other prophets never said Trinity. Jesus never even called his followers Christian. The question now is, what happened? How come my family, my friends, my church, my school books, everyone around me is saying the opposite of what's very clear in the Bible. Everyone can't be wrong, but the Bible also can't be wrong. What's the truth? If you're asking this question, then you know that there's something suspicious going on, and you're lucky because you're about to know what happened exactly, and why there are different stories made up about Jesus. But before you know, we must agree on some ground rules first. Number one, truth will only reveal itself for a person who is really looking for it, without bias. Number two, history is written by victors, but victors are not always on the right side. Number three, Bible is not the words of Jesus himself. In fact, it was written years after the death of Jesus, by men. So what you read now is their understanding of the religion, not his. Number four, every prophet had haters who wanted to kill him and his followers and to stop the religion of God from spreading. Number five, believers and righteous people who obey God are not loved by kings throughout history. They are very hard to control, they will ask for human rights and they will oppose slavery, they will ask for justice, it's not good for dictators and emperors. Number six, prophets and believers are also hated by people who like to live a guilt-free, sinful or criminal life. This is why most prophet stories were tragic. Do you agree? Great. Now let's first imagine, for example, if Moses didn't open the sea to flee from Pharaoh. Imagine if Pharaoh actually caught Moses and crucified him. Moses and most of his followers were executed. And after years of this incident, Pharaoh assigned one of his men to write the Old Testament for us. Do you think it will be 100% accurate? In Pharaoh's mind, it will be very good chance for him to control the remaining believers who weren't executed instead of just killing all of them, you can just kill their ideology instead. But he can't fabricate a whole new religion for them, that will be obvious. But he can make small changes that will destroy the essence of their belief. What if that happened? And now we find these writings and translate them to English and base our life decisions and our destiny on them. That would be a disaster, right? Thank God Moses wasn't executed by Pharaoh. Thank God Pharaoh drowned before destroying our opportunity to enter paradise. But what about Jesus and the Roman Empire? What about Jesus and his haters? Who was victorious this time? Did you ever think about that? Let me introduce to you someone called Paul. His name was Saul of Tetris. Paul himself says that he persecuted early Christians beyond measure. He considered Christians his enemy. Then he got an idea better than persecution. He claimed that somewhere in the desert, he received divine revelation from God. Like prophets. He claimed to receive divine revelation. Can you believe that? divine revelation. God chooses the best of the best to send them divine revelation and make them prophets. 
God does not choose the enemy of Christianity who persecutes believers to send him divine revelation. Acts 9, 4 and 5 He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Galatians 1, 11 and 12 I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of a human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor I was taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, there is no way to confirm that he received divine revelation. You have to take his word for it. But when prophets claim that they have received the revelation from God, we believe them if they have miracles to prove it. But if you were persecuting Christians, so not the most righteous man, and you don't have miracles, and you claim to receive revelation, and you can't prove it, why should we take your word for it? If he is really getting divine revelation from God himself, then at least his writings should be free of error and should be consistent with the teachings of Jesus, right? So if we can prove that he had errors and contradicted Jesus several times, it's fair to say that his claims are false and he was trying to invent a new religion. Do we have a deal? Okay, challenge accepted. Number one, Paul claimed he knows exactly when the end of day will be, even though Jesus himself said that only the Father knows. Number two, Paul claimed that he will be still alive when Jesus finally comes back, which didn't happen. Check out this explanation from our good friends at Many Prophets One Message. Paul of Tarsus has done more than any other person in history to influence and shape conceptions about the person and message of Jesus. The early followers of Jesus were hunted and persecuted by Paul, who started out as a zealous enemy of Christianity. Then one day, while on a sandy desert road to Damascus, Paul said that he had a mystical encounter with a disembodied voice claiming to be Jesus. From there, Paul went on to become a super evangelist, dedicating his life to spreading what he claimed was the message of Jesus. Paul's biggest claim to legitimacy as an apostle is the divine revelation which he said he received directly from Jesus. For example, Paul wrote, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, there is no way of independently verifying Paul's claims of mystical desert encounters with Jesus. We just have to take him at his word. What we can do to test Paul's apostleship is to scrutinize his writings. He made repeated claims of divine inspiration, and since God is all-knowing and all-wise, it stands to reason that Paul's writings should be free of error. In the following prophecy, Paul provided a timeline for the world's end. We will not all sleep but we will all be changed, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Sleep here is being used as a metaphor for death, so Paul seems to be saying that not all of the believers in his day would die before the return of Jesus. Obviously this is a false prophecy, as it has been nearly 2,000 years since Paul wrote these words and the return of Jesus still has not taken place. In fact, many New Testament scholars and thinkers conclude that Paul and his followers expected the imminent end of the world. For example, the distinguished New Testament scholar Professor C.K. Barrett wrote in his commentary on this prophecy, Paul expects that at the Perusia, second coming of Jesus, he himself will not be among the dead, of whom he speaks in the third person, but among the living, of whom he speaks in the first person. He expected the Perusia within his own lifetime. A virtually identical end of world prophecy can be found in the Gospel of Mark. The renowned Christian apologist C.S. Lewis wrote that it is the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. Now some Christians try to defend Paul by claiming that when he made the statement, we will not all sleep, he was not including the believers of his day among those who will not taste death, but rather he was referring to believers at some unspecified time in the future. So what did Paul intend by his statement? Should we interpret it literally or figuratively? We can look to Paul's related prophecies to help us arrive at the correct understanding. In the following prophecy, Paul advised believers with regards to how they should conduct themselves going forward. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn, as if they did not. Those who are happy, as if they were not. Those who buy something, as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world, as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. 
Note Paul's statements about marriage, emotions and materialism. Believers are told that all such activities are futile, as time is short and the world is passing away. Believers are advised to avoid such things from now on, i.e. with immediate effect going forward. This is clear proof that Paul genuinely believed that the world's end was imminent. Otherwise, his advice about living as bachelors, not feeling human emotions, and being completely detached from material things is nonsensical, as Christians would have been unnecessarily going about life as celibate, emotionless ascetics for nearly 2,000 years and counting. This is highly problematic when we consider the standard that the Old Testament lays out for true divine inspiration. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. We can see that according to the Bible itself, Anyone who makes a claim about the future which then fails to come true cannot be inspired by God. Number three, Paul made a mistake trying to quote scripture. Paul's core teachings is the idea that salvation is achieved through faith in Jesus alone and not any kind of works. As Paul informed us, But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Here Paul is quoting from the Old Testament in order to lend support to his theology that we are saved by faith alone and not works. Let's take a look at the original passage in the book of Deuteronomy. The word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so you may obey it. Notice the problem. Paul has taken the quote out of its original context. He left out the part that states, so you may obey it. In other words, Paul has omitted God's command to obey the Mosaic law. We can see that the original passage in the Old Testament actually establishes the opposite of what Paul intended. Works are indeed important. Another of Paul's core teachings is the idea that all of God's covenantal promises to Abraham were fulfilled by the coming of Jesus. As Paul informed us, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. Here Paul is making the argument that God's promise to Abraham did not speak of seeds in the plural, but rather seed in the singular, and concludes that the single seed is a reference to one man, i.e. Jesus. Let's take a look at the original passage in the book of Genesis. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. The original Hebrew word used for seed is zerah, which is a collective noun that can be used to refer to both a single descendant or many descendants. It depends on the context in which it appears. This is just like the English language. For example, the word sheep can mean one sheep or many, depending on the context. So how should we interpret the mention of seed in the Old Testament? We find an answer in the same book of Genesis. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Here God promised Abraham that he will be blessed with a multitude of descendants, likening his seed to the dust of the earth. Therefore, we can see that the correct context for seed is not a single seed, as Paul incorrectly interpreted it, but rather many. Paul taught that the nation of Israel will be saved from its sins through Jesus, as Paul informed us, and in this way all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion, he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. Here Paul has quoted from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. Note the clear mismatch. Paul's quote mentions that the Saviour will remove sin from Israel, whereas the book of Isaiah states that the Saviour will come to Israel after it's repented from sin. Just what is going on here? Paul may have been quoting from the Septuagint, a Greek version of the Old Testament. And the Deliverer shall come for Sion's sake, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. We can see that Paul's quote closely matches the Greek Septuagint. It turns out that there are two variant readings of the Old Testament, the one in Hebrew and the Greek Septuagint that Paul seems to have quoted from. There is in fact strong evidence that the Greek Septuagint contains a later reading. This is because the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest surviving manuscripts for the Old Testament, support the reading that is found in the Hebrew Scriptures. This means that when Paul chose to quote from the Greek Septuagint, he unknowingly used the later incorrect reading. God obviously would not have inspired him to make such a mistake. Number four, Paul contradicted Jesus. Paul offered the following reason as to why God revealed the law to Moses and the Israelites. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that for this purpose every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. According to Paul, the law was revealed to make us realize that it is impossible to keep, and that we are therefore all guilty before God. Let's compare this to what God has to say about the law in the Old Testament. Now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so you may obey it. 
we can see that God says very clearly that the law is not too difficult to obey or beyond our reach, which is the complete opposite of what Paul claimed. Paul even had some very negative things to say about the law. Here he called it a curse. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. Paul also had bad things to say about his past efforts of keeping the law. Here he referred to it as garbage. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But to whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. I consider them garbage. Again, such negativity is at odds with what the Old Testament teaches. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you. Here God stated that obeying the law will bring one blessing and prosperity. We can see that Paul's teachings about the law completely contradict the Old Testament on many points, so Paul cannot have gotten his message from the same God that inspired the Old Testament. Number five, Paul was too faced hypocrite who would change what he stands for based on situation. The Bible informs us that towards the end of his ministerial career, Paul visited Jerusalem, which was home to thousands of Christians who zealously obeyed the law of Moses. We are told that senior Christians directly confronted Paul about rumors that he was preaching against the law of Moses. If Paul was a genuine apostle, then we should expect him to be forthcoming about his true beliefs and teachings. Let's now see how Paul actually reacted. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come, so do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. We can see that the senior Christians in Jerusalem commanded Paul to undergo a public head shaving ritual that was derived from the law of Moses. Paul submissively complied with their command, thus denying the rumors that he preached against the law of Moses. Now, in the previous section, we saw examples of Paul's negative attitude towards the Mosaic law, labeling it a curse and describing efforts to obey it as garbage. By conducting himself in this manner, Paul was being two-faced, for he behaved in one way to the faces of senior Christians and another way in his writings. In the following examples, Paul wrote that Jews are the same as non-Jews and no longer bound to keep any of the Mosaic law. There is neither Jew nor Greek. We have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. We can see that Paul taught the very things he was accused of and deceptively denied. So before Paul, early Christians believed that Prophet Jesus asked them to repent and obey the commandments to have eternal life in paradise. But after Paul, new Christians believed that you don't have to obey the commandments to do anything. To enter paradise, you just have to say that Jesus is son of God or part of a trinity and he was crucified and resurrected from death. How convenient. This means that if you are a murderer or a rapist who believes in the resurrection of Jesus, you will be in paradise. And if you are a righteous person who prays to God and donates to the poor and helps society but doesn't believe Paul's claim about Jesus, you will be in hell. Have you ever seen a judge in court saying to a criminal, instead of sending you to jail for your bank robbery, I will kill my son to forgive you and set you free? A debt must be repaid to God, only it's not about restoring a sense of justice and honor in God, but rather in finding a source for God's wrath due to our sin. Jesus took our place, taking upon himself the curse of immeasurable pain that was rightfully ours so that we could go free. Again, what sort of God is so filled with wrath that he demands that his son die so that he can be satisfied? Give it a second. Think about it. And instead of punishing the criminal for his mistake, the judge will kill his son instead. His son. That's amazing news for the criminal. Why wouldn't someone who loves to live a sinful life believe that? It's so easy and convenient, just believe a story and do whatever you want in life without limits. And then enter God's eternal paradise. But is that really fair? You tell me, if Adolf Hitler believed in the Trinity and the resurrection story, he should be in eternal paradise, right? But is that really fair? I ask you, do you keep the laws and the commandments? You say no. I say why not? He says the law is nailed to the cross. Why not? He says we are living in the grace. 
That's what the Christian says. You're living under grace. I say, where did you get this? This idea that the law is nailed to the cross is done away with. Where did you get it? So he quotes me. Philippians, Galatians, Corinthians, Thessalonians, Colossians. And so who's this? Who's this? Timothy, Romans. Who's all this? Who's this? Who's that? So Paul, 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 Paul. I said, who's your master? You say, Jesus. What does he say? You're contradicting Jesus. And Jesus said, the disciple is not greater than the master. Master is Jesus. What he tells you, I say, I listen to my master, Jesus. He never had the pig. He, none of his disciples ever touched that pork. You call it pork, ham, bacon, whatever you call it. He never touched that stuff. None of his disciples ever touched it. And you're all pig eaters. Christians. Where did you get this? He said, Peter had a dream. On that dream, now you eat pigs. When my master never ate it, he wouldn't eat it. It was abhorrent to him. He killed 2,000 pigs, one hit. He destroyed them all. You know that? But now you don't listen to him. You are now living in the grace. I said, are you circumcised? He says, no. I said, why aren't you? It's a major commandment. God gave. Your Lord was Christ. Jesus Christ was circumcised. I said, what is good for your God should be good for you. No, you won't circumcise. Why won't you? This is the law of God. He entered into between Abraham and his descendants forever. And you claim to be spiritual descendants. How does that absolve you? Is Jesus was circumcised and you are not? He said, no. He says, Paul said, circumcision, circumcision is nothing and non-circumcision is nothing. I said, Jesus says, not even one jot or one tittle is to pass from the law. Can't you see? You are not following Jesus. You are following Paul, Paul, Paul. He is the real founder of Christianity. Paul, not Jesus. After that, Paul's new religion was mixed with Roman and Greek paganism. Number one, this is not Jesus. Jesus was not a European white male. Forensic scientists have done facial reconstruction of 2,000 year old skulls from Palestine in order to get a sense of what Jesus might have looked like. Number two, Jesus was not even born in the winter. Shepherds were tending their flocks outside, which only happens in warm weather. And it was also the time of the taxes in the north. It was not winter, not the 25th of December, and not the 7th of January. The sun was very important to the people in the northern hemisphere because of the very cold weather. They would pray to the sun god every winter to bring back the warmth of the sun. In 274 BCE, Rome established this day to be the birthday of the sun god. Later, under their influence, the church adopted this day as an annual religious festival for the believers. So, the birthday of the sun god became the birthday of the son of God. Shocking as it sounds, followers of Jesus Christ in both America and England helped pass laws making it illegal to observe Christmas. Believing it was an insult to God to honor a day associated with ancient paganism, according to Shocked by the Bible, 2008. Even the Christmas tree is an old pagan ritual. Can't you see your religion is changing over time? Can't you see that government after government is writing what you should believe in? Number 3. Easter or Estera. Estera is the Teutonic goddess of the spring. Her symbol was rabbit and egg. Pagans were celebrating their spring god every year with eggs. This pagan festival was adopted by the church only in the 8th century. It has nothing to do with Jesus. Number 4. Trinity is an old pagan religion concept. The Babylonians worshipped the trinity of Nana, Shamash, and Ishtar. The Egyptians worshipped the trinity of Amun, Ra, and Ta. Hinduism believes in the trinity of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. The tribes of northwestern Europe worshipped the trinity of three female deities. The Persians believed in the triad of Ahura, Mazda, Mitra, and Anahita. Are you still sure you are worshipping God? Number four, this is not the cross. This is the Ankh. It's the Egyptian symbol of resurrection at the time of pharaohs in old Egypt. This mix that we have of pagan religions is a version of Christianity that you're being taught now in school, churches, and on television. 
1945, exactly in the city of Nagah Hammadi, Egypt, we discovered several manuscripts like the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Truth, the Gospel of Judas, the Coptic Gospel of the Egyptians, and many others. They are currently housed in the Coptic Museum in Cairo, Egypt. They are proved authentic, carbon dated, and yet the church refuses to add them to the Bible officially because they have information about the original Christians that contradicts the current pagan belief. In the first gospel, Gospel of Peter, Jesus was not tortured nor crucified. That happened to someone else. In the second gospel, Book of Sitt al-Akbar, Jesus was saved by God. God raised him to heaven and they executed another man. In the next gospel, A'mal Yohanna, no harm has fallen upon Jesus. But they don't want you to know that. If you know that, you will not go to them for confession or holy water anymore. Take care. For the medieval church, the need to keep a grip on their power and influence was rivaled only by the drive to make money. Church officials at all levels were primarily concerned with selling get-out-of-purgatory certificates. They also enjoyed spreading the word about how working for the church would ensure your social position on earth and reserve you a spot in heaven. This fixation on profit went so far, parishioners were often warned that any and all expendable income they came into possession of should be given directly to the church. In the book of The Evolution of the Gospel, a new translation of the first gospel by John Powell, published by Yale University Press in 1994. The author demonstrates how its peculiar characteristics can best be accounted for as being the result of insertions and manipulations. Jesus didn't order you to donate part of your income to the church until the church becomes so powerful, even more powerful than kings, that it can control Europe for the whole medieval period. Jesus didn't approve of the Crusades, the holy wars in the name of the cross, invading countries, killing innocent people and enslaving them, and stealing their riches. Jesus didn't approve of building your country's wealth on the sweat and blood of innocent enslaved Africans. Jesus didn't approve of wiping out whole civilizations of Native Americans. Jesus didn't approve of the idea, which is widespread now, that his religion is the source of violence or a way to control the masses. So it's better to avoid following him at all and become this tolerant, hollow Christian that stands for nothing. After all, we're living in the age of grace. And just live a life of pursuing happiness in any way possible, doesn't matter if it's moral or not. Is this the religion of Jesus or Satan? If Jesus sees current generations who are called Christians, however living their sinful lives, getting drunk, eating pork, ignoring prayers, promoting sexual freedom outside of marriage, supporting homosexuality, following whatever they see in the media, tolerating everything that Jesus will never tolerate, exchanging the truth about God with a lie, and finally hoping that they will be in paradise, if Jesus sees all that, he will say, wow, Satan, you have destroyed everything that I built in my life. People are running away from the religion of God and resorting to atheism because unfortunately, after distorting and manipulating God's words, they don't make sense to them anymore. Christianity already lost the battle against evil when Christians forgot their original message from God. Fortunately for us, throughout history, every time God's religion was manipulated or distorted, he sends us a new revelation, a new prophet to revert us back to our one and only religion. There is no religions plural. There is only one God and one religion, which all prophets, and I mean all prophets, were teaching. Everything else is just tradition of man and made up stories that you should take care of and not let it deceive you from the truth. Acts 2, 22. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Romans 1, 25. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. If you completed this video, 
congratulations. Believe me, my friend, you watching this is not a coincidence. It's time to rethink your life decisions before it's too late. If you want to know the truth, join us on Facebook and Discord and join our Q&A sessions or request a private online meeting with us. We will answer all of your questions. We strongly recommend watching our video titled Was Prophet Muhammad Christian? You will not believe this. Links are in the description and first comment. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that bell icon.